listening to the Futures Podcast with me, Luke Robert Mason. On this episode, I speak to the UK's leading cyber expert and lecturer in media studies, Trudy Barber. 1992, I think it was, when I created the world's first immersive sex environment in virtual reality. Trudy shared her insights on the history of cyber sex, the future of teledildonics, and the emerging field of sex robotics. This episode was recorded on location at Central St. Martins in London, England, where Trudy was scheduled to give a visiting lecture. So Trudy, I know you as the UK's leading cyber sex bird. What is cyber sex? Well, cyber sex is basically a way of exploring um, how people use various types of technology for sexual purposes. And this can be anything from sexual identity through to actual sort of sex acts of sex online or with with any kind of technology you can imagine, really. Because people, if they can uh, try and invent new tech, they will also try and do all sorts of deviations with it. So you've been working in this space since uh, since the mid-90s. Yeah, 1992, I think it was, when I created the world's first um, immersive sex environment in virtual reality. So how do you create an immersive sex environment in virtual reality in, in, the, <laughs> in the mid-90s as yeah, well? It was so clunky. It was unbelievable. And I mean, I mean, the headsets at the time then were like putting a small cathedral on your head for a start off. So everything weighed a ton. You were sort of uh, connected with all the wires and everything else. And what we did was we made a very, very basic um, 3D environment with, with 3D sound that you you floated into. You had a, like a joystick and we had like the word safe sex because it was just after the time when uh, there was lots of publicity about AIDS and everything else. And so we had uh, the word safe sex and we had the body of the Venus de Milo and a male figure with one of the, well, I think it's the first erect male penis in virtual space. It looked a little bit like a Trident missile because you couldn't, you couldn't get as many polygons in as you can now. Um, so and he just kind of stood there, looked a bit like Gort actually from, from the day the Earth stood still, the original one, the 1950s. So he was there, the body of the Venus de Milo was there without a head and we had floating condoms and we had floating vibrators. And the idea was for you to fly in, pick up the condom and place it on the penis or use the dildo and place it in somewhere around the Venus de Milo. And once you did that, you got the orgasmatron effect. You were thrown into this this pattern of space with me moaning in 3D, going, oh, oh, like that. So it was it was a whole thing to raise AIDS awareness and we and um, also to get people to understand that this technology was coming. And I was so excited by ideas of sort of the robot body, the, how the body connects with technology. And I was doing a lot of artwork about it because I was a, a student at Central St. Martins at the time. And I did it as my undergraduate study. It just sort of took me over. It obsessed me. The whole thing was just fantastic. And going into this alternative space, this, you know, the, the William Gibson conceptual hallucination. I could see the future. I could see how people could connect in and the things that we could do with it. And then the internet, of course, was starting at that same time. People were getting in the internet into their homes. So I could see this kind of link up with the VR and the, the internet. And I, I just couldn't believe what was coming. So how do you go from a fine arts practice all the way through to exploring technology in the body? I mean, what was the point at which you went, you know what, I'm going to be a cyber sex expert? <laughs> well, um, because I, I did a lot of drawings of the body and I also did a lot of artwork to do with technology because I, I was artist in residence with National Power, for example, and I drew um, all the power station um, at Forley near Southampton. And the only way I could identify what I was drawing really, because I, I didn't really know what, what all these machinery was, was in my head, in my mind's eye, I turned it into a human figure. So all the piping and wiring were veins, all the, all the big boilers were like the lungs, and all the big turbines were like the legs powering the machinery. So I thought this was really interesting, and wouldn't it be nice to turn it the other way round and look at the body as a piece of technology. So I went and drew cadavers, and they were kind of stripped down to expose all their veins and stuff. And I thought, right, this is a machine. 
So then I thought, right, what happens with an artist and who draws the body, who deals with the body all the time? I know, they have affairs with the life model, don't they? They have their muse. So I thought, right, let's take this. Let's look at technology. Let's have an affair with this tech. Let's try and put the sex into it. Let's sex up the technology. So that's basically what I did. And, and the, the thing about it is, at the time in London, uh, there was the the sort of fetish scene and the sexual subcultures that were really coming to the fore at that point and they were the ones who were willing to actually show the work so as I was doing my VR stuff they were actually setting up my VR installations in the nightclubs like the skin two rubber ball sex maniacs ball and that's when we decided to sort of produce something that we could raise certain awareness of but it just meant that we could start um, contesting the idea of the future of our sexual behavior and how we can fetishize things, how we can chuck that into virtual space, how we can see our bodies in virtual space, what is that going to do for our sexual identities, what's going to happen with when all the other technologies change and then you can become any kind of gender you wanted to be, what would happen if you wanted to be spanked in cyberspace, how would you get that haptic sensation? And it just opened up a whole new vista for me. So that's how it started. And I think a lot of people thought I was a bit crazy. But now it's kind of like people are just red rediscovering what I've done sort of 25 plus years ago. And why do you think it took so long? Why do you think it's only now? Is it to do with the growth of consumer devices, the fact that we can get access to VR quite easily now? Do you think that's where the interest comes from or is it something else? I, I think that um, the, the technology has become really a lot more available. It's a lot cheaper. I mean, the kit I was using, um, I, I worked with a, a company called Virtual S and they had a whole team of people working on this stuff. And um, they also did stuff for Bjork and all, you know, people like that. Um, and it was about, you know, half a million pounds worth of kit. And it was absolutely crazy. And it was huge. You need a big van to move everything. Whereas now you can get, you know, your Oculus Rift or your Vive or whatever. And it's only about, what, 600 quid. The other thing is, is that people didn't think they looked very cool wearing the headset, wearing, you know, this huge, big, clunky thing. And they were kind of embarrassed. Now, of course... It's awfully trendy and lo lovely and cool to wear your nice little VR head headset and everything else, and augmented reality and all the rest of it. So um, then, with the with the advent of the internet that everybody has access to, particularly with mobile, uh, the use of mobile media, it's become it's becoming totally commonplace. And also the, the the actual acceleration of how things are rendered, the quality of what you see in VR now is so much. Well, it's it's thousands of millions of times better than when I was originally doing it. Do you think these people are coming in contact with the same challenges, though? I mean, the, the thing that interests me most about the fact that you were doing this in the mid-90s is it feels like the folks who have just emerged in the last two to five years are hitting all the same problems that you had almost 25 years ago. I just wonder, what, what were the key learnings that you had and how are you sort of helping this next group to basically develop what they're trying to do? Um, I think we're ending up kind of recycling certain problems because at the end of the day, we're dealing with human nature. And basically, it's kind of same old, same old, but with different technology. I mean, you could almost look at it in a uh, technological deterministic way, saying that the technology is changing the behavior or is the behavior actually meaning that we're changing the technology. I think it's quite um, interesting to see how people, well, well, what's happening? What's really interesting is that we're getting young women who are taking a lot of these ideas and being entrepreneurial and actually really developing some of the ideas, particularly with things like vibrators and stuff too, which I think is really novel and I think that's really clever. And I wish I'd had that support myself. So there's, there's this idea of uh, support following through and I think there's generally a different kind of attitude to how we engage with intimacy and technology, like, you know, dating sites. I mean, you've got adverts on the TV, you know, in, uh, this website makes you look like a big pig and that's enough for you to be, you know, um, friendly with somebody. Those kind of adverts, they're hilarious. But I predicted all this in the early 90s and people would say, oh, no, it's only sickos are going to go on the Internet. Sicko people. And it was like, well, well no, actually, you know, video dating. It's the same thing, only now it's 
this kind of technology. I mean, even in the late 1800s, a woman called Ella Chiva Thea wrote a book called Wired Love, a romance of dots and dashes to do with the telegraph. So it's always kind of there. People will take the technology and want to do something intimate with it. So there's always been historical precedents for, for many of these ideas. I, I know one of the interesting places that you're playing in right now is really not just looking at the devices and how we have a, a tele-experience with somebody else, but people are now interested in the idea of having sex with robots, with objects. You have some quite interesting views on that. Yeah, the, the whole um, robot sex issue is quite interesting because you're kind of taking all the ideas I've been talking about, the idea of you know uh, technological intimacy, but you're putting it into like a golem, you're putting it into this kind of humanoid possibly looking piece of technology. Then we're looking at ideas of the happy valley. Why did these things the creep? The happy valley. The happy valley. Is it, no, is it the happy valley? The uncanny valley? The uncanny <laughs> valley. Sorry, ha- Although, I'm in the happy I, valley. I, I, oh, I almost for a second there, I thought, oh, the, the, there's the happy, happy valley. valley yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to, to what degree does the robot have to be sexy <laughs> enough for me to be happy, happy about that? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry right. about that. The uncanny valley. I'll get there in the end. Um, it's been a long week. So you've got the uncanny valley and you've got these various issues as to how we um, almost do a piece of counter-transference onto the robots. And also the idea of artificial intelligence um, enabling the robots to answer you back or say the things that you'd like them to, to say. And I think it's really a golden opportunity to examine how we do things like create love maps of, of our, our um, ideal relationship and we can learn so much about how we can integrate with the technology through relationships and I think um, also the, the other thing that I find find so interesting is the different ways people either really are interested in it and can see a future in it and there's the people who are absolutely re- revolted by it. There seems to be a lot of moral outrage attached to this idea of having sex with robots. Uh, I know there's been a campaign to stop sex robots in the same way there's a campaign to stop killer robots. I mean, what is your reaction when people start trying to generate attention around sort of campaigns like that? I mean, I think I think it's inevitable. You're going to have sort of very extreme views on, on this. Um, I mean, with the killer robots, is quite interesting because militarily uh, they're coming and they are here. There's no doubt about that. As with uh, se- sex robots, I see them as sextotainment. So we've got an entertainment thing here. You've seen those real dolls, haven't you? Yeah. Those nice big Barbie things that come in a big box. And there's that whole idea of necrophilia going on there as well. Um, it's kind of awkward because you're going to have you've got a certain stigma attached to that that kind of um, relationship people who engage in those kind of relationships so you're looking at what what I say is you've either got the robots that you want to tinker with in the garage you know you can unbolt it and stuff or there's the one that you could almost take out for dinner with you you know, they probably couldn't eat anything anyway, but they could just sit there and stare at you and talk to you. Do, do you think that's the thing that people are most concerned about, that people might actually prefer a relationship with a robot than a human? Do you think that's where a part of the moral outrage comes from? I, I think, well, the thing is, is you've also got diff- different viewpoints on, on how people perceive uh, relationships and how people engage with each other. So there's things like eye contact, there's things like warmth, there's things like expression. And what's happening is you're looking at also ideas of um, sort of spectrum identities. So being able to learn maybe how to be intimate with somebody might be an interesting thing. But I think the fact that somebody probably has to do that in the first place, some people will find that very off-putting. Well, there's been discussions of uh, using sex robots to cure paedophilia in some cases. I mean, there's, there's been these wild examples, but also do you think sex robots can be used for, for good, for if individuals have issues relating to other people in the real world? Do you think they can yeah, be used I think, to Yeah, I think that? they can be used. I mean, that there are sex surrogates anyway as part of relationship counselling. But I think uh, it's another choice. You know, it's another way of uh, choosing how to learn about yourself in a sense or 
if you've got enough money to spend and you want to spend it on a sex robot, then that's what you want to do. Who am I to stop you from doing that? It's another, it's a, an additional choice for sexual behavior and it's additional choice, as I say, for entertainment value. I mean, with the, all these um, sex doll brothels that have made, uh, made it in the news recently, I mean, I could see see those as being sort of places where you could have really weird stag nights with, with a whole load of these weird dolls you know again the sex entertainment idea but then of course you've got different jobs coming out with this you could be a sex technologist or a sex entertainment engineer you know all these sort of things that, that can happen now so I don't know it's I think it's part of human nature and and the idea of of having just this um, idealistic viewpoint of, you know, sex and the body and stuff, I think it's out the window. You can, it, there's, people have fetishes for all sorts of things. People engage with sexual practices in all sorts of different ways. And I think it's inevitable that the, the robot is going to be part of that because that's the way we are. You, you've discussed this term in your work, the datification of sex and how those sorts of objects may actually lead to that. Could you explain what the datification of sex is? Um, I think that, well, yeah, the datification of sex, the datification of pleasure, uh, it's already happening particularly. Um, well, when I originally did my research, I, I studied a group of people who um, uh, connected their bodies up to their internet server, created their own server. And um, they had all sorts of um, innie outy devices and dildos and all sorts of stuff that um, would go off at certain frequencies and they could work out what their, their orgasmic frequency was. So taking this, chucking it now back, you know, forward 25 years, we've now got vibrators that actually was sending details to the vibrating company of um, the orgasmic frequencies and how often the um, vibrator was being used and all the rest of it. And the companies, I think, have been sued, I think, that was doing this. So they're, they're collecting that data, the, the data of the, the women or the men that were using those vibrators. We, we seem to be their... happy with Facebook or social media platforms taking that data, but what do you think it is about that sort of very intimate data that we find... So maybe people are worried about how often how often they're using it, or maybe they're not using it enough. It was, it was so funny with regards to what's happening with Trump wanting to snoop on ISP and internet history. It seems to be the the running joke that the thing that most people are worried about is how much porn they're watching. Oh yeah, <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah. And everything else. Like, oh god, the the government can see your porn habits. Yeah. Um, yeah. These technologies, to some degree. Don't they help people, especially the sex robot technologies, help people discover sort of what their real preferences are and give them a safe space, a safe environment to explore these sorts of things? It, it feels like a lot of the cyber sex or the early cyber sex work you did was really about helping people to discover something more about themselves. Yeah, it, it, it does allow you to, to create this alternative space where you can, you can uh, experience different things safely, particularly in relation to the idea of AIDS and everything else that was happening in the, in the late 80s, early 90s. And I think it can give you a safe space. I mean, you could possibly go into like a social network and share experiences now with vibrators and things too. So you could possibly have what I, I'm calling a massive massive open haptic online orgy yeah. or the mohu you know by doing those kind of experiences and seeing i mean if you don't like it just switch it off and that's the other thing you could just switch it off if you don't like it so um I'll just take it out switch it off <laughs> <laughs> do you think there's some worry about commodifying sex in this way i know, I know you've mentioned in previous conversations we've had with regards to look it's just it's just a different way of looking at the sex act it's no longer about procreation it's about that thing entertainment do you find any issues with the fact that it's moving that way do you think it's exciting and liberating that potentially these technologies are enabling a new way in which we interact with each other intimately i think uh, it's just like the pill the, birth, the you know the birth control pill suddenly you know that technology enabled women to express themselves and to be able to have uh, the different types of sexual um relationships that they wanted without the worry of getting pregnant and there was that whole kind of hoo ha about how you know, this is going to give some kind of really dodgy society. Everybody's going to be shagging everybody else. But I think with um, this technology and the way that we're looking at intimacy, I think it's taking it another stage again. I think it is going to be like uh, the pill. It is going to have that kind of massive impact. 
Eventually, just, it'll be normalized. Yeah. You, you think it's going to be one of these things. The same way in which 25 years ago, what you were doing, you had to do kind of with subversive groups. Now is kind of this normalized thing that's advertised and on billboards. Yeah, the same, the same way that, you know, the internet is all on our mobile phones and we carry it with us all the time. You, you mentioned um, in some previous work about how deviation is actually allowing for innovation. I just wonder if you could explain that. I love that phrase, deviation is innovation. Yeah. One of the things I found was that when I studied the people who were wanting to engage online, they were really doing some groundbreaking modifications to their kit. So they were making their own servers. They were getting people from, say, the States to log into their own private server. They were getting all the kit, going on the internet, the early internet, and buying things like all the medical equipment that so that they could actually plug themselves in to their server and of course a lot of this stuff now is is commonplace and uh, but at the time they were kind of creating it in their bedrooms in the garage and I thought that because they had these particular ideas of, and certain predilections that they were able to invent and create new pieces of tech for that and I think we've seen an acceleration of that now so I think the technology gives you the space to deviate, which in turn gives you another space to innovate further. And now it's going to the, to the extent where there's now business models. Teledonic seems to be just another one of these products that you can buy. And, and this, they're getting more sort of interesting and intimate and different shapes and different forms. It's and almost like fra a, a fractal element of, of it going many more, many more, the same, the same, many more, many more. You know, it's that kind of way of looking at a business model, I think. It's intriguing the way we have all sorts of things now in the cloud. So there was a time when you used to have your vinyl and then your CD, and now it's in the cloud. So you used to be able to have a whole shelf of things. When people would come to visit, you would have all this stuff all on display and slowly, all this stuff just disappears into the cloud and we'll be in these kind of sterile spaces with all the things that we love and, and have will be digital. But you can imagine a nice shelf with some wonderfully tailored dildos on your mantelpiece that can probably talk to you as well and tell you how to make a cup of tea so it'd probably be something like the amazon um what's her name um, amazon alexa yeah alexa that uh, vibrates for you and stuff as well and tells you when to have uh, your your bit of sex if I mean, you want to do you want a, the same relationship with an amazon alexa do you, do you want an intimate relationship with an amazon well, alexa? There, there would that be preferential there or? are people i knew one couple who um the wife got really, really upset because the husband would obey the female voice on the sat-nav and yet he wouldn't do what she said when they were at home. And actually she got jealous of the sat-nav. Do you think there's a gender imbalance with regards to cyber sex right now? And, or is that being fixed? You said you're seeing female entrepreneurs are coming forward and creating these sorts of products. And does that change the sort of thing that's created? I think one of the things you need to think about is one of the sort of sexual differences is that men do fetishize differently to women. Men can fetishize quite easily. Um, and I think we're seeing an extension of fetishistic behavior, which is not usually a particular female characteristic. There are women fetishists, but it's not as well known or as well experienced in a sense that it is for men and I think um, men will collect lots of things they will um, have passion for things like I don't know um, say trains for example train spotting you know think, I mean who on earth would want to spend all day just writing numbers down of, of trains for goodness sake but it's a passion so if you just take away the train and replace it with a big sex doll it's the same kind of thing. And it's, it's different, but it's a different kind of fetishizing than how women would interact. Um, you do have male sex dolls, also for a, a gay market as well. And the same with the, the female sex dolls. There might be some women who want to play with them. 
I mean, how do you think this is all going to eventually play out? I mean, you've seen the last 25 years. Where do you think it's going to be in the next 25? I think we're going to see a complete acceleration of the way these things, uh, these objects are developed, created, designed and invented. And I think we're going to see nanotechnologies. We're going to see different types of material, polymers and things, graphenes that we're going to change the way we even make and think about robots and then of course they'll be part of us because we will also become technologically adept with all sorts of nanotechnology in our own bodies that eventually there'll be a symbiotic link between us and robots maybe there won't be a difference anymore thank you to dr trudy barber for sharing her thoughts on the future of intimacy If you like what you've heard, then you can subscribe for our latest episode. Or follow us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram at Futures Podcast. More episodes, transcripts, and show notes can be found at futurespodcast.net. Thank you for listening to the Futures Podcast.